Hey everybody, Cliff Kelly here to uh, greet you from again another beautiful day in Colorado Springs, Colorado on Saturday, uh, April 10th, 2021. I swear I can do this without messing this. Scout's in his happy place. Now, you, you can't appreciate the fact he comes in here and he tears apart all my bedding. He brings in 14 or 15 toys and he basically commandeers the entire area. Uh, so he's, <laughs> he's, he's really in his happy place. He's resting his head on one of 14 toys. And so he's happy to be here and I'm happy he's here too. Anyway, uh, greetings. <laughs> I'm, uh, chuckling for a number of reasons, which I may or may not disclose to you. You know, there's always a back drama when I, uh, get ready to do these things. Well, let me get right to it so we don't run out of time. It's good to be with you. This is uh, part two of a series uh, entitled Notes on God's Preparation for the Approaching Storms, uh, Weathering Weariness by Long Endurance, the entire experience and notion of the concept of weariness is uh, central to a lot of what I'm, I'm dealing with in this, in this series. And most of us, if we're honest, have been feeling uh, that weariness and Try to go through some of the reasons for it, uh, why it seems to be amplified uh, in these times. Anyway, uh, part two, contending with horses. I'm going to tell you some horse stories today, uh, one of which is very precious to me uh, when I was a kid growing up in the uh, high deserts of San Bernardino County. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. Let's pray uh, and get on with it, and we'll see what the Lord has for us today. Father, I praise you and I thank you that you are so very faithful to us in times like this, <clears throat> excuse me, whether the sun is shining or not, whether it's raining or it's dry, whether the wind's blowing or it's calm, whether we are profiting and succeeding or whether we're in the midst of failing and everything in between. Um, I'm not just saying it, I, uh, I'm grateful that you're there every single moment of the, uh, the, the time that we're in. So, I just ask you today, uh, you know the back drama, so let's get on with it and uh, multiply your blessing and your anointing, your presence in what I speak on today, so that you are pleased and the people are encouraged. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> the scripture I'm going to use today is emphatic, meaning it's uh, it uses... I think I said last time, whenever the Bible uses explanation points, pay attention. Or whenever Jesus says twice, truly, truly, I say unto you, uh, in the Hebrew idiom, that means, listen up, uh, I got something important to share with you. So there's uh, three, one, two, three, at least, explanation points in the scripture from Jeremiah 46, 3 and 4. Hear it. Put in order the buckler and the shield and advance for battle. Harness the horses and mount, you horsemen. Stand forth with your helmets. Polish the spears and put on the coats of mail. Four times. Boom, 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 boom. When the, when the word, when the prophet, when the speaker, when the writer is, is uh, emphatic, this emphatic, then <clears throat> you'll know that this is something that we are to pay particular and pointed and focused attention on and it matches the nature of the hour in which we find ourselves and that's one of the reasons I, I feel I was led to this particular passage uh, some quotations I looked up the authors of each one uh, maybe the last ones are Christian I think they're all raw pagans I, I don't know I should stay at that strongly but uh, I don't think there's a Christian among them but again uh, my, my, uh, my formula, my algorithm is if it's true, then I'll share it. Uh, first one is from Paulina Simons, who has been prolific. I believe she was the Russian born in Moscow, raised in Leningrad. It was used to be called and, uh, at 10 years old, moved to the West. Uh, long list of, uh, of novels. That are, that are interesting, and I certainly haven't read them all, but from what I understand, <clears throat> they contain some pretty traditional wisdom in them. For example, this one is from, uh, again, The Bronze Horseman, 2009. There are some battles 
no matter how much you don't want to fight them, that you just have to fight them. They are worth giving your life for. I can relate, and I know most of you can as well. Some of you can't, <laughs> but I dare say you keep listening to this stuff, you will. Um, I talked a little bit about that last time. I won't go over old ground, but uh, when we are fighting for a cause that's worth fighting for, one that even is worth dying for, as with the soldier in the field in World War II, when we're literally protecting our ability to exist under freedom, <clears throat> then countless millions indeed lost their lives, and that's why we have memorials to these men and women. Um, don't have time to go into it, but uh, I didn't go to Vietnam for a, a number of not very honorable reasons in 1969. And I remember just a side, a side story here that, that I think will help set a context. When I got saved in 79 and Susie and I moved back to Virginia Beach to work at CBN and Regent University in 1983, and I uh, started my position as uh, the, uh, the director of the uh, Public Affairs Journalism Program, graduate program. I found myself needing to go to Washington to, you know, you know what you do. You connect, you network, you, you do this, that, and the other thing. And at the time, CBN had, a, had a, uh, an office there and uh, went to see the Vietnam Memorial Wall for the uh, first time. Must have been in 1985, four or five. I don't remember when it's built, so my years may not be true here. And I walked, I, as we approached it, I had not seen it before. As we approached it, I was probably 100, maybe 50 to 100 yards still away. As I approached it, I felt tears starting to come to my, my eyes. Kind of shook myself a little bit. We walked forward, got closer and closer to it. The tears became fuller. By the time I actually got to the wall and looked at it, I was a mess. It happened three different times, three different visits on different, in different years to the Vietnam Memorial Wall. And uh, th the third time, I, you know, basically just pulled myself aside and said, God, you know, what is this? It's a little bit embarrassing. What, what's going on? And the thought came, not a voice. The thought exploded in my mind. Those men died in your place, son. And uh, I never forgot it, never will forget it, and they did. I played all kinds of games back in the 60s to get out of service. I, I told you the story before, I won't go into it again, but I went back to Washington when I, and when I turned 40 and tried to go join the uh, Army National Guard. And that's when the two sergeants looked at me and, and I had asked them, can you use somebody like me? They said, well, son, only if it gets really, really bad. Anyway, didn't mean to do all that, but there are some battles you just have to fight. Dad taught me that when I was about 11. There's said things in this life, son, you got to do. Don't want to do them, you just must. Second, Michael Morpurgo wrote the, I think it was a screenplay for War Horse, an incredible movie, in 2010. Uh, and he's describing what it's like to ride a horse, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Blind terror drove me on with my flying stirrups whipping me into a frenzy. With no rider to carry, I reached the kneeling rifleman first, and they scattered as I came upon them. There's just this rush for those of you who are horsemen or horsewomen uh, who ride horseback. and There's just something extraordinary about riding at full gallop. Uh, a strong horse. Uh, finally, this one's from A.J. Lauer and Daniel Keitel. Uh, and I, these are Christian writers. I couldn't find any bio on them, and I didn't read the whole book. So uh, this is from one of their books, Armageddon, Pick Your Plot, 2013. I'm not sure if they were writing with their tongue in their cheek uh, and mocking the whole idea of the apocalypse or not. So wish I could give you more context, but I can't. Here's what they wrote in uh, that book in 2013. Your eyes meet and you immediately feel you're shriveling under his gaze. 
He bears a scale in one hand and appears to be weighing your worth. Finding you wanting, the horseman of famine turns his dark steed and trots on. I write about those uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse in my book, The Sixth Seal, uh, which is still out of print, so not selling anything. That horse of famine is one of the more fascinating ones that some of us believe is on the horizon. We saw the first kind of harbingers and markers of that when supply chains uh, interacted with COVID-19. I just talked to a businessman yesterday. I'll never get to the teaching. Thing. I keep thinking all these stories. This is what's happening when you're old? Um, a businessman at, uh, I was getting a couple of new tires on on my old uh, Mirage and uh, I'll tell you more about that too. The, uh, he was just working and he turns out he was he was uh, one of the supervisors for a massive region uh, for a company that manufactured uh, uh, roof tiles. And he was talking about what happened when COVID came, the supply chains broke down. And now that the supply chains are getting back up to speed, there's chaos. That's the word he used. There's chaos. There's more demand than they can meet. The supply chains are still kind of choked off in certain areas and house prices are, you know, gone way up and the demand for houses is way up and number of houses is apparently insufficient. I mean, one little micro, one little micro has done all this, has changed the course of history in one year. I find that fascinating. First thoughts, when I was but a wee lad growing up, as I started to mention in the high desert of San Bernardino County, California, wasn't much out there in the 1950s. Uh, my grandpa, C.W. Kelly Sr., he's a mean son of a gun. <laughs> he's, he's, I'm just going to tell stories all day because they keep rushing back. My dad told me grandpa used to go into a bar in the 19, uh, about the time of World War, right after World War I. He's just this mean. He'd uh, sit down at a bar stool and between two guys, and he'd turn to the guy on the right and say, Hey, this guy was just bad mouthing you. He was. He turned to the guy on the left. This guy was bad mouthing you. He just, I probably shouldn't tell these stories about my family. And he'd start a bar fight so he could, you know, get in his licks. Crazy man. Um, rough cut Kansas City dirt farmer, he used to call him. Moved to California and developed a fortune in real estate by just using common sense. Um, I never saw any of that. Um, I don't know why I'm telling all these stories. I'm just, I think I'm in a bit of a reminiscent mood uh, for reasons I may or may not disclose. Uh, anyway, he used to raise horses. He was in World War One in the United States Army Cavalry as a horseman. And uh, he had horses in a small, dusty ranch in San Bernardino, California. <laughs> I was about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years old. And me and my cousin Bill, we called him Willie Lump Lump. I have no idea why. That's what we did back then. And uh, we'd ride some of the horses. My favorite horse was this massive golden palomino named Easter. Uh, at, and Grandpa taught, taught us how to ride. We were just little kids. They'd get up on this big horse and, you know, saddle up, stirrup up, and uh, reins up. And we'd go ride all over the county. I had no fear of that massive horse. Uh, I don't think I'd know what to do with one today after all these years, but I remember feeling so free and powerful uh, as a little kid riding that, riding Easter. It would usually be on a Sunday. Uh, I could tell a bunch of stories. I'll never get through this. But I, I, I learned how special horses were at, at a young age. Um, dated a wonderful young lady in high school named Delreen McLaughlin, who to this day loves horses and dogs. She's, uh, we were riding when I was about 16. I didn't know what I was doing. She just took off. Horses are special. I don't know much about them, but I learned about them at an early age and learned to respect and love and admire them at an early age. And I say all that because in preparing this teaching on becoming a horseman, uh, contending in battle with horses takes a very special kind of individual. I really believe that. So I'm talking about horse soldiers today as kind of the metaphorical second stage 
in the preparation that God's doing in all of our lives for what we're going to face up ahead. That may intimidate some of you. I don't say it to intimidate you. I say it because it's true, as far as I can tell. I don't think you have to be a Christian to understand stuff is coming toward us. I was just reading today about, and you know, I'm not trying to do scare tactics here, but I read constantly, and uh, Russia has just uh, dispatched 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border uh, for all kinds of reasons. Putin <clears throat> probably running scared. <clears throat> He's losing his grip on power and influence. <clears throat> Best way to do that is start a war. <clears throat> China uh, is becoming more and more aggressive around Taiwan. You know that. Those two hot spots are significant only because they're in, they're in Scripture. Those two countries are very prominent in, uh, in the apocalyptic literature in the book of Daniel and elsewhere. So, anyway, just mentioning those sorts of things to cheer you up. The whole point is... <sighs> One, I've been driving home for months and months and months. Well, driving, I'm not, I'm not sure I got them driven home, but I've been talking about them. We're being prepared for an era of real challenge. And, and what I see in churches happening is this la la rolling out the same old teachings. I think the last one I heard, and I don't want to mention any names, hurt feelings anymore, and I already have, you know, seven weeks on teaching the Lord's Prayer. All right. Prayer is vital in this tower. Question is, what kind of lessons are you going to teach about prayer? It was, it was not an anointed message, you could tell. It was flatter than yesterday's bread. If, if there is not a vision in the pastor's heart, mind, spirit, and mouth about what's going on right now, what God is calling us to, those churches are unable to prepare the congregation for what's coming. And I'll say more about that before I finish, if I ever do. <clears throat> um, let's see, I've lost my place a little bit. Um, there's a quote from Cormac McCarthy, my favorite novelist. He wrote a lot about the West and horses. And this is from All the Pretty Horses, 1992. The protagonist he's describing. What he loved in horses was that he loved in is what he loved in men. The blood and the heat of the blood that ran them. All his reverence and all his fondness and all the leanings of his life are for the ardent hearted. New word. And they would always be so and never be otherwise. He loved horses because they were ardent heart. I'm going to say lion hearted. Look up the word for ardent in Noah Webster's 1828. Hot, burning, that causes sensation of burning as ardent spirits, that is, uh, uh, having the appearance and the quality of fire, fierce, uh, applied to the passions and affections, passionate, affectionate, much engaged, zealous, is what kind of heart we're supposed to have in this era. This era. I listen to pastors being polite. I walk out. There's nothing there to follow. Uh, and I think they know it. I know my precious friend, former friend, I guess, preaching last. You could tell he didn't want to be in the pulpit. You could tell he did his, there was no fire there. And I know that he's in a wrestling match with God, and it's a good one. I hope, I trust. Not unlike Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord all night long until God prevailed. Although Jacob thought he prevailed. he prevailed because he survived, came out with a hit pointer, that he came out wiser, the wiser. May all pastors be in that kind of struggle right now. Not a struggle to run away, to avoid, to ignore, to tiptoe through the, not the tulips, the stones of fire, and get it together. It's one of the reasons why the Lion of Judah was quoted in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, when I probably read twice before, when he said to that particular kind of church, I know your deeds that you are neither cold, invigorating, refreshing, nor hot, healing, therapeutic. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm, spiritually useless in the extended Hebrew form, uh, Greek form, 
and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth and tell you I never knew you. God will not settle for tepidity. God will not settle for timidity. God will not settle for insipidity. God will not settle for lukewarm. He just won't. And it's not up to us to be hot rather than lukewarm, but it's up to us to submit to God and invite him to bring the fire into our lives so that we act and cook and speak and make decisions lit by his fire. The Valor, Section 2 of The Horse Soldier. In 2018, saw a movie that I had read the book about years before, didn't know it, uh, starring Chris Hemsworth, who I love. I just think he's a dude. He seems to have good family life and great sense of humor. And he's pretty, but uh, he's a good actor. Um, I don't know if he's a great actor. I mean, how far can you take Thor? Uh, but he was in an excellent film based on a true story uh, called 12 Strong, based on a book that I had read while I was at uh, Liberty University uh, by Doug Stanton, Horse Soldiers, 2009. It's an extraordinary movie. I can't, I'm already, geez, I'm already behind. Uh, let me skip all this. It was a story about the first 100 or so uh, Special Forces, Green Beret, uh, I can't remember, United States Army Green Beret Operational Detachment, Alpha 595. I like detail. And in a matter of days, weeks maybe, I can't remember the time frame, they uh, took Taliban down, the Taliban down, and restored uh, control of the government to the uh, Afghanistans, Afghanistanians. Extraordinary. At the end, i got to skip over all this because I'm already way behind. At the end of the movie, depicted in the book in much more detail, they had they had uh, their special forces guys. I think only two of them know what to do with a horse. But they had to mount horses and go against the Taliban, uh, you know, like 20 to 1 uh, odds against them. And in the last, part, in the last scene, uh, when time was running out and if they didn't act fairly soon, they had to go in and fight the fight. They rode in on horseback at full gallop with their uh, long rifles firing away. And uh, they, they took the Taliban down. It was, if you haven't seen the movie, it's worth watching just to watch that last scene. Uh, that seems to be relatively accurate depiction of these incredible men uh, who risked everything uh, in that now too long war it also demonstrated what we can do with a few men uh, as over against tens of thousands of them in a protracted war anyway uh blah, 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 blah. let me go down here uh so i'll skip over all that you can read the details fascinating uh by and then by sheer in your face force of character skill and raw courage they did what needed to be done that's what god wants in us Character, skill, and raw courage. That's what he wants. I'm convinced. They, they did demonstrated that one of the words I used a minute ago, uh, intrepidity, defined by Noah Webster as uh, to tremble, uh, to no, not trembling or shaking with fear. Hence, fearless, bold, brave, undaunted as an intrepid soldier closely resembling a, pri resembling a primary character characteristic of the valiant soldier in the field or the valiant soldier in spiritual combat, which is what we're called to do. CUF, courage under fire. Courage under fire. I'm trying to think of how I, I, I react under pressure. It's not... <laughs> I just can't disclose to you. Let's just say for now that just before these things go online and I'm doing the video production, my family has to clear out and leave the premises, if not the entire city. I'm a little intense on these days. I don't understand that. I don't know that I'm particularly intense. Do you? <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. 
and I get down here, uh, the thing that came to mind, the courage of Gideon. You know what? I'm going to talk about Gideon only a little because I'm almost out of time already. Gideon was, oh, let's see if I have a description uh, uh, of what he was, what kind of man he was. No, I'll have to get to it uh, uh, and let the written version. Basically, he was just a, a good guy, a godly man. There's no warrior, champion, you know, hero. It wasn't it, you know. And God comes up to him, and I'll just let you read the, the text. And says, uh, Gideon, oh, brave and noble warrior. I can see Gideon say, uh, who's that you're talking about, boss? And there's a lot of reasons that we could go in depth and, and deal with that and how how wonderful that is. One of the commentaries said, it's God's sense of humor, you know, um, or not. And there's a section in here that I quote, uh, God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, a barley cake to overthrow the tents of Midian, that the excellency of the power of almighty God might be his alone. Is alone. There's a, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's not in the text. God will never call us to more than we can handle. Yeah, he does it all the time. He does it all the time. You feel like you're overwhelmed with all this? You are. And for what purpose? To destroy you? No. So that you call upon him in desperation. And that when you break through and get to the other side, and you will, if you hold on to him, he gets the glory and you get the backwash. You get the after effects. You get, you get the blessings, but he gets the glory. That's why we boast on it so much. Uh, boy, I've just butchered that all up. Anyway, you can read all about it. It's a great story, classic story. And then Jesus later on, after re detailed review of the story of Gideon, how, you know, he started out with something like 22,000 men. He was feeling his oats. He was feeling pretty good. Okay, God, we're ready. God says, no, that's way too many. Got him down to 300 men. And with 300 men, with lanterns and loud trumpets, completely wiped out the enemy, the forces of Midian. So, so many, so many principles that we can derive from that so that God could get the glory and nobody else could say, wow, we, you know, we outnumbered them. No, you didn't. Jesus said a lot of radical stuff that I never hear preached in the church. I just don't. Am I going to the wrong churches? I've tried maybe over 12 to 15 churches in this town in the last three years. There's one I have a little hope for. Calvary Mountain, uh, Rocky Mountain Calvary Chapel. We'll see. I'm going to go back there tomorrow, second time. <clears throat> Matthew 10, 34, 36. Jesus said, and I think with loud voice, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth, beloved. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, listen to this, of division between belief and unbelief, between those who really follow me and those who do not. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household where one believes and another does not. Jesus said that would happen, especially in the last days. And I know, I know you, I know many of you are struggling with that right now. But it's the reality of the hour, of the last days, just is. I mean, Jesus said it 2,000 years before it happened. Actually, it started happening right after men went out and started preaching the gospel, but on steroids today. Mm. Mm. Not only do I have a triple tall white vanilla soy, triple strong, but for the first time, I knocked back a, uh, a nitro I came here because I couldn't sleep last night. Um, pastors tell me, the ones that are still talking to me, few are, that just before Sunday morning, they're, you know, they're 
ideas and you know Satan is trying to move them around jack them around in there so I finally got to sleep about 2 or 3 in the morning last night woke up at 7 so I needed a little booster <laughs> nitro is good anyway I shouldn't say those things but I love coffee I believe coffee will be in heaven well I can't say that with any authority mm. but something even better probably anyway I'm over the map here. And because Jesus said that would be the reality, in various shades and hues and tones and manner and strategy, we have to stand for God's truth, doctrine, canon, word. We have to stand. Now, in all of your families, everybody has to work that out differently. It doesn't mean that you have to be mean, but it does mean you have to confront, you have to engage, or you have to be silent if they already know where you stand without, you know, killing them. That's against the law. You can't do that. But we have to stand. I'm going to end on that very point today. You have to stand. You have to stand. And pastors, pastors, pastors. Do not be so afraid to confront evil and departure from the canon in your own church, in God's own house. Stop being afraid of it. Just stop it. You have the power. You know, if you will begin to do this, I can promise you two things. One, <laughs> they want to, they may want to throw you into the alley out the door, but two, God's presence in your life will be multiplied exponentially. You'll never be closer to the Lord than in the moment of that decision and what follows. It'll be better than ever before. Daniel, if you're brave enough to watch this, I'm telling you, you ain't seen nothing yet if you'll do this. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary promise. I mean, enormous intimacy with the gifts of the Holy Spirit in, in ways that you couldn't imagine for those who are faithful and will do this. Jesus did it, so must we. If we are ever to gain back the ground lost to our convenience, our cowardice, and our doctrines of wicked men, meaning things that I'll name in the last teaching of this series the small L lions that come to destroy us that are not lions at all. I'm going to name them. Uh, I've mentioned a few of them before, but I'm going to lay them out in the last teaching. Identify them so that you know who to confront or who to avoid and ignore entirely. And who to stand with and for. Six lessons from Gideon. Just quick, uh, won't go into the details again, just overview this from a, an excellent sermon by Dr. Lloyd Stilley, who was then, I think still is, the lead pastor of Jasper's uh, First Baptist Church in Alabama on New Year's Day, January 1, 2014. Point number one from Gideon, God uses tough times to get our attention. This is from Judges 6 uh, and may go into 7. Judges 6, 1 through 6. God uses tough times to get our attention. Pastor, pastor, Daniel, pastor, he's shouting at you in love, believe it or not. Wants you back. Wants you in, in it to win it. Wants you in the arena. Really in the arena. Not play church. He wants you in because he's given you all the gifts that you need to engage this fight. If you'll just buy in. There's a line here that the pastor points out. Every and I just this came to me, I don't know, a month ago or so. So I, I'm slow to the dance, but I get there. Every experience in our life is a test. Especially if you're a Christian. Everything we confront, every it's a test. Everything's a test. I, I was uh, uh frustrated when I cried that out a month or so ago. I got God, does the test ever end? I didn't need to hear the answer. No. 
Not until the eschaton. Not until this fight is done. No. We're in a test every day. Win some, lose some, pass some, fail some. If you're anything like me. Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. Do not despise the test. Do not despise the Lord's instructions. Don't, like I do so many times. You know, the kvetcher, Dr. K, the kvetch. Try not to do that quite so much. C.S. Lewis perhaps said it best. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. He uses judgment to wake us up so they can really live again. Number two, God sees more than we do. Hello? He sees the whole thing and we're just looking through this little tiny glass darkly. Wait a minute. Where's my, my wife? I needed a, uh, a, a magnifier. But my wife gave me this. It's a little embarrassing for a great scholar. but I have a I have a righteous one somewhere. Hold on. Now that's a looking glass. Anyway, um, he sees the whole picture and we don't. And that frustrates and frightens us. Unless we trust him, who does see the whole thing and is implementing a plan at every second and moment of the day. If the plan is always moving forward, the plan is always in force. Even though we fall back and drop back and fall down, the plan is always moving forward if we'll get back up and say, okay, God, engage again. Let's try it again. Uh, verse 12. God has a sense of humor. That's where I got this. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. That's when Gideon couldn't figure out who he was talking to. And it's probably good that we feel that way. There's a sense of humility and Healthy self-effacement. Who, me? Number three, God confirms his priorities with his presence. That's what I was talking to you pastors about. If you'll turn this thing around and say, I'm done playing pastor. I'm in this thing now, boss. Let's do this and make sure your wife is along with you. Very important. I mean, I can just promise you by the word, by the text, by experience. You will never have known the Lord in this way than you will if you turn that thing, turn the reins over to him, say, go get it. Let's do this. Whatever you say, up or down, win or lose, keep the house, don't keep that. Just do it, Lord. And your preaching will be, just be incandescent. Also, I have a line here from the pastor sermon, uh, verse 22 in uh, Judges 6 says that the pieces, once Gideon did that and submitted to the Lord, all the pieces in his life started to falling together. This has been happening in my life ever since I lost all the jobs. And I said, okay, God, what do you got? The pieces just fall into place. Do I have major battles? Oh, talked about that last time. But the pieces are fitting together now. They're synchronous. There's a, there's a flow. There's order. You know I love that word. Number four, private faithfulness is a prerequisite for public usefulness. you got to get your own stuff together before God can use you publicly. Just does. That's why all the leaders from Franklin, Graham on down, y'all better be getting on your knees and then publicly saying, I really messed up. I don't know if God can use me again, but if he can, I'm... I'm in. I'm willing. Got to clean up our own backyards, pastors. Quit pointing at the Democrats and the liberals, okay? Stop it. Now, I know. I know how bad they are. But I also know, for the most part, I'm hearing more wisdom and truth out of them than I am from you. Number five, God is faithful with our faith process. Everybody's at a different place in their walk. Some are just starting out. Some haven't even begun. Some are way down the road. Some are in the center of the road. Some are off in the hinterlands shooting squirrels when you ought to be hunting lion. And just like 
Gideon, a doubting Thomas, if you were. Well, we're going to do this fleece, Lord. How about this? God does it, and then he flips it and does another fleece. I don't know about where you are with fleecing. I do it on occasion. I don't think it's out of God's will to do it. If your heart is just, I just want to hear what you want me to do, boss. I neither advocate it or oppose it. It's just something that Gideon did, and God honored it. Six, and finally, success is determined by God's power, not ours. Success is defined by God, not us. I just prayed that prayer this morning. Lord, I don't know if I'm succeeding or not. People say nice things. That's fine. I have an audience of about four. <laughs> it's bigger than that. But I, I was out walking uh, Scout the Wonder Dog, and I just said, Lord, you know what? I don't even want to bring this up. You tell me. You define for me, and you let me know your standard for success, and uh, I'll just shut up. Just tell me what that standard is, and I'm waiting to hear from you. No, no, I'm not begging for encouragement. I'm just saying that's a real prayer. But success is determined by God's power and his mind, his definition, his plan, his purpose. Uh, there's a quote here, Gideon's now ready to rumble, but God has other plans. In Judges 7, 2, I mentioned it before, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many people for me to hand the Midianites over to you, or else Israel might brag, saying, I did it myself. So he knocked out 22,000, left him with 300. D.L. Moody said, you've heard this before, give me 10 men who fear nothing but sin and love nothing but God, and I shall change the world. 10 men could have saved Sodom, couldn't find him. Are there metaphorically 10 good men in the American church today? I have my own doubts. I don't hear them. Not talking about the remnant where the faithful reside. I'm talking about the pulpits. So this is what I call pre-wrath boot camp. Boy, I'm running out of time. The most significant thing that the good Reverend Doctor said at the outset was every experience in life is a test. And unless our pastors start to teach this narrative, these doctrines, this rough-hewn interpretation of our times and the scriptures pertaining to our times, we shall remember, we shall remain, and I came up with another phrase, forever flaccid. Flaccid is defined by Webster, soft and weak, limber, drooping, hanging down by its own weight, yielding to pressure for want of firmness and stiffness as a flaccid muscle, fit only to hunt squirrels, not lions. So to the teaching, seven warfare dif disciplines from the scripture uh, that we started with in Jeremiah 46. I, I just, again, out of time, I have lots of detail here. Order, buckler, and shield. The prime directive of spiritual warfare prep is taken from the word for order, my favorite word maybe, in the Hebrew arak, translated as to arrange my un, oneself in full battle array. We've been through this a little bit. You arrange yourself in full battle array every day before you go out of the house without fail. Second, Advance for battle, taken from the Hebrew term nagash, to draw near, approach close enough to the Lord to engage the battle, and then close enough to the enemy in going mano a mano, hand-to-hand -hand combat. There's a lot of militancy in my voice because, listen, man, this spiritual battle is serious juju. I shouldn't use that term, but I, this is serious stuff. It's not... That's why I get so frustrated with these polite little oh everybody. Yeah, you need to go on vacation. We'll go bowling. Yeah, everything's fine. Who has time for a two-week vacation in the body of Christ? Sailing on a boat in the Mediterranean? Are you serious? Who has that kind of time? I don't. Even if I had the money. I wouldn't. Are you kidding? I'd be going nuts the second day. This playtime, recreational worldview in the American church is disgusting. Living only to buy the RV and travel for, you know, six months. That, that's dead and gone, beloved. There's no time for that.
Harness the horses. The next order of preparation from the Hebrew Asak. To tie or bind oneself to a swift mount for battle. Figurative of being under absolute authority to proceed. To gird oneself and get on with it. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, fighting the spiritual battle every second of the day, but to be ready for when it comes. You never know. You'd be out buying a cup of coffee at Starbucks and boom. Somebody comes up to you, whispers in your ear, what? What? What are you wearing that mask for? What are you, an idiot? What are we going to do? What are we going to say? How are you going to say it? Next, mount up. I keep seeing John Wayne in my, well, saddle up. Pilgrim. Mount up. A direct reference to the horse soldiers or cavalry my grandpa rode in in the First World War. Here we have a rather poignant word, both literally and symbolic, meaning a number of things, including to go up, to ascend, to rise up, and then I don't have time to go into all of it, but from Isaiah 40, 31 and elsewhere, it is the same word from which the Hebrew derives al, the, the Allah for, to Aliyah, to making Aliyah, to going up to Jerusalem, to returning from the diaspora, to go back home. Uh, I've thought about, you know, that, uh, given my mother's uh, Jewish heritage. To go up, to go up, not to go hide down here. Go up. Stand forth. Maybe the most important phrase and all of this, from the term yatsab, to set oneself, to station oneself, to be on that wall, to refuse to back up. Yatsab. Polish the spears. Now, this one gets pretty metaphorical. Uh, to scour, otherwise sharpen, to keep them clean and glistening, ready for battle. That is your knowledge of the text. This is your spear. This is your sword. You have to know it. That means you have to spend time with it. Not just listen to pastor on Sunday morning. That's not enough. Every day. Every day. He gave you that book for a reason. Your field manual, if you will. Next. Finally, running out of time. What's new? Uh, you put on coats of mail. You armor up. I've talked about that from Ephesians 6. I don't go to the house without putting on that armor. You think that's silly? It's not silly. It's keeping me alive. Keeping me in the fight. Keeping me in front of the camera. Keeping me writing. Got John Gill's commentary here. Who ends with, Engage the enemy briskly then, and with the greatest of courage, and use all of your military skills, speaking spiritually. But if ye not have God first, big caps, all ye have done, it will all be in vain. If God is not Foremost, hundred, a thousand and one percent at the helm by your invitation and by your conduct and followership. Don't, please, for heaven's sakes, go to battle. Last thoughts. Charge of the Light Brigade. Depending on what historian you read, battle that took place on October 25th, 1854, the most disastrous, boneheaded, savage, needless slaughter in some of the history of British warfare or the bravest thing that men have ever done. I'll let you read the account and you can decide. Charge of the Light Brigade. The point of which that I extract from this is that that disaster was because of incompetent leadership. And I'm making a comparison without apology that the vast majority of the Christian church and the congregations in the United States of America are no more prepared to go up against the lions of hell with BB guns? It's a serious matter. I've said it before. Pastors, you're responsible for what happens to those people to a large degree, not entire. You can't afford not to give them full body armor and weaponry and ordnance. You can't, but you are. One account as I close from uh, 
the editors of History Online Journal. By all accounts, the charge itself was a disaster. Someone spotted what they thought was an effort by the Russians to move artillery they had recently captured from the British and friends. The order was given, the charge, the cavalry, both light and heavy brigades, plus infantry, would assault the ridges and recover the heavy guns. The cavalry commander dithered. He dithered. Waiting for the infantry to show up, and they didn't, orders were given to advance rapidly to the front, but no one defined which front they were supposed to advance upon. The officer delivering the order was asked to clarify, and he vaguely waved toward what Alfred would call the Valley of Death, one of the observers, the Valley of Death. Orders being orders, the soldiers obeyed. And let's see, of the, hundred, of the 670 men who rode in to withering fire, 140 died and 110 were wounded, and 400 mounts, 400 horses died that day. Incompetent leadership. Incompetent leadership. There's no question that the British soldiers acted with extreme courage in the face of incompetent leadership and in a note of irony or justice, depending on your perspective. The first to fall that day was the message bearer who'd waved his arm lackadaisically in the wrong direction. <coughs> consequences, baby. Pastors, consequences. Don't dither. Don't dither. Thought I had that defined somewhere. From Noah Webster. To dither, a trembling, a vibration, a state of flustered excitement or fear. To act irresolutely, vastly. Tremble with excitement or fear. To act nervously or indecisively. Pastor. Indecisive. And then there's toxic followership. As bad as the pastor's indecision is the blind followership of the mass of 80% of the congregations in America. <clears throat> well, the pastor said it, it must be true. He speaks for God. Because they don't read it on their, on their own. Finally, and this is a little dangerous, a time for anger. Frankie Schaefer, Francis Schaefer's son, wrote in a book in 1980 something. I can't always find my... Yeah, there it is, 1982. <clears throat> he was angry about the fact that the evangelical church was at that time, and I was part of it again, shamedly, uh, politicizing. It was becoming political. <clears throat> it was gradually replacing the true canon with political strategies, political people. <clears throat> I won't name them yet, but I may next in the third section as I've done before. I came across, and finally closing, David French is a, one of my heroes, small age, but he stayed steady. I love his writing. He's well-trained. He's an intellectual. He's a man of God. He's an attorney, God forgiven. Uh, but he stayed true along with him and his wife. And he wrote an article 17 days before the January 6th Christian insurrection <clears throat> in Washington, D.C. I quoted it in full, but I'll just read some snippets and close. I'm not writing to engage in a serious theological debate anymore, and I'm not either. Not interested. With those who've committed themselves to dreams and visions of dark conspiracies... I'm writing as a warning and as a call for action. Here's the warning. While I hope and pray the protests remain peaceful, they didn't six days later, 17 days later, and that seditious statements are confined to social media, we'd be fools to, prefer, to presume that peace will prevail, will reign. There's a prophetic voice. He was right. Here's the call to action. Pastors. It's time for conservative Christian leaders to shed any form of fear and to speak against conspiracies and against slander with the same boldness that many of them speak for Trump, still to this day. 
Again, this isn't about just witness. We've talked about that before. It's also about justice. It's about law. It's about real peace. About truth, about honor, integrity, character. One last thing, I'll be honest. I wrote this newsletter angry. You can hear the anger in me every week. I prayed about it until I can't speak anymore. Make this go away, Lord. Make this go away. I don't I have never talked this way before in my 40-year career. And I'm not laying it all and blaming God for it, but I'm just saying I agree with David French in a whole lot of ways. I think he ends up. I wrote this newsletter angry. I don't like to write angry. Hear me. Hear David French. But there are times when the lies are so blatant and the danger is so profound that anger isn't just appropriate. It may be necessary. I believe now is one of those times. I believe God would rather have you zealously, righteously indignant instead of sitting there, oh, well, you know. I'll just live my quiet life and I'll pray. I'll pray every day. I'll just, you know, I won't speak. I won't engage. I won't confront. I'll, I'll just pray. And stay quiet. Now, there may come a time, as in World War II Nazi Germany, when we'll have to go quietly into the closets and underground, into the catacombs, and into the hiding places, as Corey Ten Boom wrote about it. But not yet. Not yet. I finish with uh, the anger of Nehemiah when he found out what the leaders were doing in his time. Yeah. Am I asking everybody to go get mad now? No. For those of you who have an ounce of discernment, you know that's what I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to godly zeal. I'm calling you out of lukewarmness. I'm calling you out of indifference and cowardice. Pastors, leaders, it's not me calling you. I mean, I'm just mouthing what I believe with all of my heart and being, God is saying, to tell you. And I remind you again of Revelation 3.15. Jesus said, Pastors, I know your deeds, and I know you're neither cold nor hot. I know this. I know you and I know your heart. And if you don't change, I'm going to vomit you from my mouth. I'm going to remove your lampstand and you will no longer be a pastor of that church. I will see to it. I don't know how he could be more direct. So... I end with this. <clears throat> Since our American pastors have so far refused to do the 80%, and the primary reason we have an increasingly lawless America, we do, is to be bloody and perhaps brutally honest. I believe with all of my heart now, after five years of thousands of hours of observation and prayer and study and more prayer and debate, we have a de facto lawless church. That's it. That's the problem. That's it. A de facto lawless church who won't put the truth out there in unadulterated, unashamed, unafraid manner. So to paraphrase the honored pantheon of the Christian faithful, from Polycarp to Luther to Wilkerson and beyond. For those of us who are trying, miserably sometimes and hardly perfectly, here we stand. We can do no other. So help us, God, please. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for a rather rambling discourse today. If the anger be from you, let it stand and illuminate. If it be from me, Quench it and remove it forever. In Christ's name, raise us up, Lord. Amen. Okay, well, that's not the way I wanted it to turn out. It is. God bless you. Love you. We'll see you for the last part uh, this coming Wednesday.